My guest today is Chris Heiser. Chris is the co-founder and CEO of Renovo Motors. He's out in uh, Silicon Valley. And we're going to talk about his remarkable Shelby electric sports car um, that uh, could be used for a rocket sled by NASA, I think. But we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that later on. So, Chris, welcome to EV World. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure having you with me here. All right, well, look. What we've got here is an extraordinarily powerful and quick Shelby uh, two-seat sports car um, that goes like a bat out of hell. <laughs> so we want to talk talk to you a little bit about that. How did this all How did this all come about? Well, when we started the company uh, back in 2010, we were focused on EV performance, and we thought a lot about what that would mean for a car. Um, and we instantly knew that whatever we had, or whatever we were going to build needed to be very, very fast. And by fast, it didn't just mean that it had to go quickly on the street, which the, our coupe does, but it also had to be quick at the track that uh, customers that are willing to shell out half a million dollars for a car, which is what our car costs. Yeah. They are, uh, they've got a Ferrari, they've got a Lamborghini, they've already got something in their collection that they can measure it by. So we needed a vehicle that would be extremely quick. Uh, but that it could also sustain that performance for a long time. So that, mean that, that meant it had to have a lot of cooling capacity, it had to have a lot of power, it had to have a lot of braking capability, a lot of handling. So that led us to a partnership with Shelby. Um, Shelby American is a company that builds the chassis that we use, and they build it specially to, uh, to our specifications and allows us to put our extremely powerful drivetrain in there and deliver a car that weighs about the same as a Ferrari 458, accelerates to 60 in a little over three seconds, and terms very, very competitive lap times during a lapping session uh, that you might take it to. And it also has fast charging. It allows you to bring it into the pits and charge it up quickly and go back out again. So okay. again, that, that, uh, that Ferrari was a target for us, and we wanted to show that you could create an electric vehicle that had the same level of performance. Um, on, a, uh, on kind of a sentimental level, we love Shelby's story as a pioneer in the 1950s uh, and 60s, yeah. and someone who took American performance to incredibly high levels, winning Le Mans uh, in uh, 1964, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, the FIGT championship in 1964 in Le Mans in 1965. So the Daytona Coupe, which is the vehicle that our car is based on, is a historically significant car in America and belongs to a brand Shelby that inspires us even today uh, for what teams of people who are focused on performance can do. Right. So what's your background? What are you in, in uh, racing? Are you an electrical engineer? I mean, how, what, uh, what inspired you to think you could build a, a motor and a car like this? Yeah. So my background is actually more on software and uh, uh, mobility, but I've been uh, an amateur racer and a, a huge fan of, of cars and motorsports my entire life. And my co-founder, Jason, uh, is similar. He had a career here in Silicon Valley in the tech space, but had always felt that uh, automotive was in his future. And back in 2010, we had friends at Tesla uh, who had been working there, who had found it, helped found Tesla. And we saw that having a huge automotive background wasn't necessarily the most important thing to building a really awesome electric vehicle. The, the guys and gals at Tesla were uh, product designers and people that built electronic books and things like that. They were they were Silicon Valley people. And so that gave us a lot of confidence that we could take what we had learned in our careers here and apply it to the car. And if you look inside of the uh, our Renovo Coupe, you'll see something that has 80 microprocessors, uh, six high-speed CAN networks, almost 1,000 sensors uh, that generate tens of gigabytes of data every All single right. day. So the car looks a lot more like a data center uh, than it does uh, sort of a, a traditional automobile. And so that was... That, that gave us a lot of confidence that we would be able to build an outstanding product uh, and led us to uh, found a company and uh, start work. We, we built the, co the company originally in Jason's garage in Palo Alto, which okay. there's quite a few startups around here that, that starting Seem garage. to do that, yeah. What, yeah. what, what, what does garage space go for in Palo Alto per square <laughs> foot these days? <laughs> yeah, luck luckily it was Jason's garage. If we had to rent a garage in Palo Alto in 2010, it would have been, would have been a little expensive. But yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, why a sports car? I mean, you know, Tesla, of course, has done that. You've got Detroit Electric. You've got any number of 
people that have sort of pursued that, you know, that route. My uh, my, my my good friend Jill Du Pasteur over in that Venturi did the same thing. You know, um, Ian, uh, you, you may know or you know are familiar with Ian Wright. Uh, Ian, of course, came out of Tesla and and you know built that little Wright speed, and then of course. He's since moved on. So why, what inspires you, know, you guys to do sports cars first and maybe not something a little more practical with a little more wider market application? That's a great question, Bill. So one of the biggest challenges as a small company is you don't have the industrial production scale of someone like a, a Nissan or a Toyota or Volkswagen or, or General Motors. And what that means is that it's very, very hard to build a low-cost EV, that most of the things that make it low cost have to do with massive factories that right. build at the highest volumes. So for companies like ourselves, and, and like you said, Venturi and Rightspeed and, and a bunch of other people in the space, um, the high-end market, the supercar market, sports car market, performance market, is an area where we can actually build cars and we can build them profitably. And that's really important to small companies who don't want to raise billions and billions of dollars of capital before they put out their first product. And Tesla kind of showed the way here with the Roadster. Um, in fact, they bought their chassis from Lotus. Right. So that was a model that, that we uh, followed for our vehicle. We, we uh, buy our chassis in partnership with Shelby. But going to that high end of the market allows you to put a product out there that people will appreciate and can buy and isn't just something that the company is spending a ton of money just putting out there for the sake of putting it out there. It's an actual business. I think all of us would love to get to high volume. Um, and again, Tesla has shown that that takes billions of dollars yeah. to do. Um, and Fisker, Fisker's restarting production, but by the time they get back on their feet, they probably will have spent a total of $2 billion getting to production. And then you've got Ativa and Faraday Future and all these other companies that um, are, are raising massive amounts of money. Uh, and it's a it's a very challenging thing to do. Um, it brings a lot of risk associated with it. So we like starting at the high end of the market and, and working our way down. And the coupe's a, a great way to begin that journey. Okay, so let's talk about the engineering and the car itself. Um, how many people you know did you bring in to work on this? And what I was intrigued about is looking at the uh, under the bonnet, to use a British term, um, is that. You've got these orange wires and things going. It almost looks like, a, in some respects, almost looks like a gasoline engine. You know, when you went out, oh, look at it. you got the, you know, uh, orange exhaust manifolds coming out of it, you know. So talk a little bit about uh, the design. Why did you sort of take the approach that you did? Yeah, so actually we did it exactly for the, for the reason that you just said, that it gets people talking about the powertrain and about the technology. Um, we think it's a huge missed opportunity in the Tesla or the Leaf or, or name any kind of in-market EV. You don't really see the technology at all. It, uh, you can't point to the battery. You can't point to the motor. You can't point to the power electronics units. They're all either hidden underneath trim panels or they're just completely hidden underneath the body of the car. This is a new technology and, and people are looking to find ways to connect to it. And in fact, a lot of the hobbyists that built EVs yeah. a generation before us, or, or in fact, in Silicon Valley, the oldest electronic uh, association, uh, I believe 1967, was yeah. founded here. So you're talking, people have been doing this for, for 50 years. Yeah. And the, the people that came before us sort of rejoiced and enjoyed the technology and wanted to build it in a way that people could see it the same way that in a gas car, when you open the hood, you can point at the intake manifolds or the exhaust manifolds or the carburetor or the AC compressor. Um, that's missing in the EV space. And we wanted our coupe to bring that into the conversation and allow people, both uh, technical uh, people that know what they're talking about, as well as young kids who are just starting to get interested in cars to be able to point at something inside of the engine bay and say, what is that? Right. And then you can say, that's what this is a power electronics module. So we just felt that was a huge missed opportunity by a lot of the OEMs. Uh, and we packaged it in a way that refers back to uh, some of the technology that came before, uh, but presents it in a very different way. And so it's been really effective. When we launched the car at Pebble Beach uh, last year, we had people who knew exactly what the car was coming up 
Uh, and then their daughters and sons would be sort of tugging at their shirt sleeves and saying, it's an electric car, dad, it's an electric car, mom. Right. And, and that was great. That, that really accomplished what we hoped that it would. Yeah, so what was it like getting into Pebble Beach? I mean, typically that's reserved for, you know, expensive, classic, automobile, vintage, you know, collector cars. Uh, every now and then they'll, they'll let, uh, you know, a General Motors or somebody in there. What was it like you being in there? So uh, the organizers of the event were really um, supportive and helpful uh, of what we were trying to do. And um, the Pebble Beach, the Concord, they judge cars, but there's a uh, at the putting green, they have something called the concept lawn. And the concept lawn generally has vehicles from supercar manufacturers. Um, and uh, and that was an area that they gave us uh, to show our car. And what was great about that is the year we showed in 2014, um, there was an already a very wide variety of cars there. There was a Porsche 918, which is a, uh, a hybrid car. Right. There was a McLaren GTR, uh, a P1 GTR, which is also a hybrid. There was yep. a Tesla Model S, which is an all-electric. Um, the diversity at the supercar market is really outstanding. And so um, we were maybe worried that our car would sort of stick out, but I think it actually fit in really nicely with the other products that were there. And in terms of uh, the crowds coming by, uh, you could see that that they felt this was extending the the legacy and the scope of of what Pebble Beach was, and I think that that's one of the reasons why the organizers really enjoyed us being there. Because as the the people that appreciate uh, the uh, vintage cars are are kind of moving, you know, uh, from generation to generation, they love things that allow younger people to connect. Right. And, uh, and this technology certainly does that. Right. So who's your Elon Musk? You know, you're, um, you know, the, the, the founder of this company, just as Mark and, uh, oh, God, I've even forgotten their names now, Mark Happering and, you know, the guys that started Tesla. Uh, Elon was sort of their uh, lifeboat, um, came along and changed the whole landscape there. But that's another story. So, so, so you know, how have you guys funded this? So we're venture backed. Um, okay. We began with angel investors uh, and then have uh, brought on uh, venture capital firms. So that's good. The Silicon Valley is a place where if you show vision uh, and you execute on that vision, people will support you. And we have managed to come a long way in five years. Uh, and so we are fortunate enough to have great funding partners along with us that support us. Uh, and that uh, encourage us to you know, continue to push what's yeah. possible in our market segment. So, so we're we're very very lucky. I I I, uh, I have a huge amount of respect for, for Elon Musk, but I hope there is only one of him. Yes, out there. <laughs> <laughs> he's. Uh, I think if I think if there were you know ten or fifteen of uh, of Elon running around, um, watch out world. So uh, yeah, but uh, but we have obviously a lot of respect for him. Um, the original founders, uh, Mart and Martin. Uh, uh, our our friends yeah, Mark, and in fact just, Mark Mark Tarpening yeah, is, is right. uh, one of our advisors and began oh, advising okay. us before we uh, started the company. So um, Dave Lyons, also the in, in, initial uh, engineering director and a good friend of mine from IDEO Product Development, has been involved. So um, we've tried to learn uh, as much as we possibly can from the people that have that have come before us. All right. So how much can you share with us? How much you've got to invest at this point? Or is that oh wow! Uh, no, I, uh, we uh, we keep that uh, we keep that under wraps. Okay, but, uh, but it's but it's it's not as much as you think. Um, we again, we are not focusing on high volume production. So when Tesla launched uh, the uh, Roadster, I think they'd raised about two hundred and fifty to three hundred million dollars, yeah. and then they they raised another billion dollars to get Model S going. Um, we've we've raised a fraction of that. Um, okay. We don't need the same capital footprint that someone like Tesla does. Right. There's a lot of competition for talent in this area now. And everybody is sort of robbing employees from, <laughs> from each other. You've got Apple's involved now. You've got uh, Google, you know, out there. You've got what is uh, uh, this new one, Ativa or whatever it is. You've got some, uh, you know, Chinese companies that are now coming in. Um, and then, of course, you got the big, the big guys. You know, I had an opportunity to uh, to go to Ford's uh, facility there in Palo Alto uh, earlier in the summer. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got, I mean, these guys are really starting to focus their attention on all that talent there. Is that made it a little difficult for you? And how many offers have you gotten to uh, go to work for them? 
Uh, uh, well, let, let me answer the, the first part of that question. So, uh, you know, we, um, we're, we're lucky in that the, what we're focusing on performance is a, uh, a somewhat uh, narrow segment of the market. And performance generally attracts people with a huge amount of passion for that particular area. And, and in Silicon Valley, uh, passion is a huge factor in when why people decide to work for one company or right. another. So, so we've been quite lucky in that uh, when we want to bring people on board, when we identify someone that we'd really like on the team, um, that's been something we've been pretty successful at. We, we get probably about um, maybe 40 to 60 resumes a week okay. uh, that are unsolicited. And so there's a lot of people that, that like what we're doing and, and want to be part of this team. I think that when you're trying to build a large operation like Ativa are, they're essentially trying to clone, as I understand it, Tesla's operation. They're hiring, you know, you know, interior designers and closures and, you know, the, all, the whole car. Right. Uh, for that, they are, they're hiring right out of Tesla. Um, yeah. You know, the same thing with, with Apple and Google and their programs. So I think those guys have a little bit of harder time. They're really there's a limited talent pool. By the way, if you're listening to this message and you love cars, please move to Silicon Valley because <laughs> it's only going to get bigger. It's only going to uh, get this, bigger. This is, this is a runaway freight train. So this yeah. this is the. I mean, I, I have huge respect for Detroit, and Detroit's not going anywhere. But but uh, you know, if if the sort of high tech is what you're interested in, please come out and join us. But anyway, uh, uh, it's it's. Been, we've been fortunate to be able to bring on the talented uh, people on the team that we want. That might change in the future as we scale. It might become more of a problem, but so far it hasn't been something that we've been too worried about. 